Hello everyone and welcome to a new video on the Future Programmer YouTube channel as we continue to learn about the Streamlit package in Python. In this tutorial, we're going to learn about how we can display raw data elements in our Streamlit applications. Without further ado, let's begin. As always, the first thing that we're going to do is run our Streamlit application in a web browser. As you can see here, I have my source code. And since I'm using the Sublime Text Code Editor, I can simply use the build system that comes with the Sublime Streamlit package. And now we can see our Streamlit application opened on the right side of my screen. And now we can begin writing our code for this tutorial. The first raw data element that we're going to talk about is JSON, or as it's referred to in Python, a dictionary which is basically a collection of key value pairs. To start off, let's create a dictionary. So I'm going to write inventory, which is our variable name, is equal to, in curly braces, we have apple, which is our key, and a value of 10. So let's say we have 10 apples, and we have a total of, let's say, four computers, and we have a total of 39 books. How can we display a dictionary like this in a Streamlit application? Well, we can use the st.json function. This function is going to take an argument called body, which will pass in inventory. And we don't need to worry about the expanded argument just yet. We'll talk about that in just a second. Saving this file and clicking the always rerun button, we'll see the JSON element displayed right here. Apple 10, computer 4, book is 39. You can see as I hover over these lines, I have this blue button show up on the right side, and I can click on this button to copy this specific value to my clipboard. So if I want to use this in a text file or in a code file somewhere, I can just paste it in. Or if I want to copy this entire element, I can click on this blue button at the top of the element right here, and I can paste in our JSON element somewhere else in my computer. Now notice that when this file ran, our application had this JSON element expanded. So we can see all these values and our keys, but what if we have a super long JSON element and we don't want to show everything to the user when the application is opened? Well, that's where the expanded argument comes in. So let's say we have st.json and we have, let's say, quiz1 with a list of values, 100, 95, let's say 98, 96, and we have a second key value pair, quiz2, and we have 93, 91, 88, and 93. I can change the expanded argument to false. This way, once the application is opened, we see a new JSON element, but it's not expanded. So I don't have to see all of this if I don't want to. I can click on this triangle right here to expand everything if I want to see the details of this JSON element, but at launch, it is going to be collapsed. Similarly, I can actually hide all of these values if I click on the triangle button right here. The expanded argument doesn't prohibit you from expanding or collapsing the element, just how it shows up when the application is initially opened. Now, the JSON function is extremely useful when you want to show short snippets of data like this one right here, which is have three key value pairs that we want to show to our user. Even something that is moderately long like this one might be better suited for another data element like table, which is what we're going to talk about right now. Tables can be shown in Streamlit applications using the st.table function, which takes an argument called data. Now, data can be stored in multiple different ways if we want to pass them into the st.table function. The first way is with a data frame. Now, data frame is a member of the pandas package, which we'll have to import separately using the line import pandas as pd. Now pandas is a very popular Python package that's used with data science, and data frame is one of its most important features. For the sake of time, I'm going to copy in some code and we'll talk about what it's doing. So here we have df as the variable, which is equal to a pandas.dataframe object. And in this construction, we're passing in two arguments. The first argument is a two-dimensional list. This list, if I unwrap these lines, we can see it more clearly. In this outer list, we have four smaller inner lists. 
Each of these is going to represent a single row in our data frame object. The first row has Joe, 10, this string of numbers, and mathematics. This corresponds to the columns argument. So columns is equal to another list storing the values of name, grade, student ID, and favorite subject. So we can see the name is Joe, grade is 10, student ID is this number that starts with two, and favorite subject is going to be mathematics. Each of these three lines also represent three other students. If I want to show this data frame in our Streamlit application, I can simply pass in df to our st.table function call. And we can see on the right side, we have this table nicely shown right here. If you would rather not use a pandas data frame to show your table, then you can also do so with native Python lists. So I can have st.table, and for data, I'm going to pass in a two-dimensional list. And the outer list is going to store two smaller inner lists. The first one is going to have the values of A, B, C, D, and E in uppercase. And the second row is going to store the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4, and lastly, 5. I'm going to wrap the code right here so we can see it more clearly. And we can see on the right side, we have a table shown right here. The first row stores A, B, C, D, E, and the second one stores 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And the cool thing about tables in Streamlit is that we can actually add rows to our existing tables after they're created. So if I store this table right here in a variable called, let's say, simply T, then I can call t.addRows to add in, let's say, a couple new rows. Similar as to how we created our table in the first place, I'm going to pass in a two-dimensional list with two inner smaller lists. The first one is going to store 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1, while the second smaller sublist is going to store A, B, C, D, and E, except this time in all lowercase. And we can see 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, A, B, C, D, E stored on the third and fourth rows of our table. Just for fun, we can also add some logic to this row adding operation. So I can add if st.toggle like this, add rows as the label. If this is true, so if the user has clicked on the toggle to add rows, if that is turned on, then we'll add two new rows to our table. And if I click the add row toggle again, we can see that our two new rows have disappeared. For our final two elements that we're gonna talk about in this video, I'm actually going to switch up the order between the metric element and the data frame element, just because of how similar the data frame element is to our tables, which we just talked about. Data frames are essentially just tables, but with some cool, powerful features that tables don't have. We can display a data frame element in the Streamlit application using the st.dataframe function. For this first one, I'm just going to pass in the variable called df, which we created right here. So df is a pandas data frame by default. And of course, we can display it using the st.dataframe function. On the right side, we can see a table displayed, which at first glance might look quite similar to this one right here. Except this one is not quite interactive. I can click on any of these values, any of these column headers, I can click on any of these indices, and nothing will happen. But this is not the case with a data frame. Firstly, if I hover over any part of our data frame, we can see that there are three buttons on the top right hand side corner. I can click on this to make our data frame full screen, like this. I can click on this button right here to search through our data frame for specific values. Let's say I have a data frame with 2,000 student records. Of course, I don't want to look through each of them to find the students that study computer science. So I can type this in, and you can see computer science, these are all highlighted. And I can click these buttons right here to jump through the results and find specific students. And lastly, we can also click on this button right here to download our data frame as a CSV file. Even the table itself is quite a bit more interactive. So what if I want to sort the grade level of students from the lowest grades to the highest grades. Well, I can click on the grade button right here, or this, I guess this column header right here, and we can see the students have been sorted by their grade levels, 10, 
11, 12, and 12. I can click this again to make it go in the decreasing order of 12, 12, 11, and 10. And lastly, if I click this one more time, it will reset to exactly how it was before. Now, DF is a data frame in its nature, which makes sense how we can display it using the st.dataframe function. But something like inventory is actually a dictionary when it was created, but we can also show inventory as a data frame. Here's how we can do that, which is exactly how we did it with DF. We just put in inventory instead. And we can see a table-like thing showing up on the right side. We have three rows, Apple, computer, and book. And the values are 10, 4, and 39. Once again, we can sort these values. We can sort these rows by clicking on the value column header right here. There are also a couple other arguments that we can play around with when it comes to the st.dataframe function. So let's take a look at what they can do. So st.dataframe, let's just pass in a new list. One, two, three, four. And we can see value one, two, three, four shown right here. Even a simple list will suffice when we pass it into st.dataframe. Streamlit knows how to handle that. We're not going to worry about width or height, but let's take a look at use container width. So if I put in st. Checkbox just for fun, and we're going to put in use container width as the label, and we don't need to worry about the value parameter right there. And height index, we're going to do the same thing. So st.checkbox, and we're going to pass in height index like such. And we can now see two of these checkboxes shown right above our data frame. I can click on use container width to stretch our data frame horizontally so that it fits within the entire width of our container, which is in this case, my entire window. I can click on the hide index checkbox to hide the first column, which is the index column of our data frame. I can also combine and match these two checkboxes in whatever way I would like to show the data frame that I would like to show. Now, the last element that we're going to talk about in this video is the metric element, which we can show using st.metric. Now, what is this used for, you ask? If you want to show a very important number on your Streamlit application, then metric is what you want to use. So for example, if I want to show the population of a city and it's one of the most important numbers in my Streamlit application, then I'll be using st.metric. So for label, I'll put in population. For value, let's put in 102,000, let's say 938. Delta is going to be the change that our metric has experienced. So let's say our population has increased by 19,209 when it became this number right here, then we can put this number as delta. And we'll talk about these parameters in just a second. So we won't worry about that for now. If I save this, we will see population as the label. This is going to be the actual value, 102,938. And this is going to be our delta, our change. So this is a very clear and simple way to show to our users what a certain metric is and how it has changed. And of course, if you don't want to show the delta value, we can remove this altogether. And we'll just see population is this specific number right here. Now, delta can also be negative. So let's take a look at how that would work. If I have, let's say, imports, and we set this at, let's say, 291, and just for fun, let's add in a unit of tons. So let's say this is the import in terms of how many tons of metal a certain state has imported or a certain country has imported, then we can put this using a st.metric function call. Delta, let's put in something negative. So let's say negative 910 tons, and we will see negative 910 tons. And of course, we can change this to something else like negative 910%. Notice that when the delta value is positive, the text and the arrow are both green. However, when it was negative, the delta value and the arrow are both red. So normally, Streamlit understands that when a number increases, it is generally good. So it's going to match it with a color of green. And when a number decreases, that's generally a bad thing. So it's going to make it red. 
However, there are some scenarios when that is not true. So for example, if we're trying to show the ranking of, let's say, a sports team, so st.metric, let's say team ranking, and our value is going to be seven. So we have a team that's ranked seventh in a country or in the world or something like that. And we have a delta of negative three. So delta of negative three is going to mean that previously this team was ranked 10. And now since it has decreased by three, now it's ranked seventh. But however, if I save this file, we'll see that Streamlit is going to perceive that minus three is a bad thing. It is a decrease, so it's going to show this as red. But in rankings, the lower the number is, the better the team. In this case, a decrease of three is actually a good thing. So we want to show this as probably a green number. We can do this using delta inverse, or sorry, delta color is equal to inverse. And we can see now our color has changed from red to green. And just for fun, we can also add in help, which is another argument that we can pass in. Let's put in the ranking of the team as our help argument. And we can see there's a question mark button that we can hover over next to the label. That's going to say the ranking of the team. This isn't exactly a very helpful tip, but for your specific scenario, you can throw in something more detailed and more helpful to the user. Just to recap, this video is all about displaying raw data elements in our Streamlit applications. We talked about how we can use the st.json function to show JSON objects or dictionaries in our Streamlit apps that we can see on the right side right here. We also learned about how we can show tables using the st.table function and how we can add rows using the add rows method. Next, we talked about data frames and how we can show them using st.dataframe and how we can interact with the actual elements that we show in our Streamlit applications. Last but not least, we talked about metric elements, st.metric, and how we can use the different parameters like delta and delta color to change our metric elements to exactly how we want them to show. And that's it for this video about displaying raw data elements in Streamlit applications using Python. I hope you found this tutorial helpful. If you did, please consider subscribing to the Future Programmer YouTube channel down below. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments and I'll be more than happy to help you out. With that said, thank you very much for watching this tutorial and I hope to see you in more videos in the future. In the meanwhile, happy programming!